Welcome to another episode of Marketing Tips for Doctors. I'm your host, Dr. Barbara Hales, and today we're lucky to have with us Gary Chan. Companies hire Gary Chan to help them build or improve their cybersecurity program, and he has had 16 years of experience, four security certifications, and an electrical engineering computer science degree from MIT. Having worked in over a dozen countries, Gary has deployed security solutions to multiple state agencies, built the information security program for large cap companies, mentored cybersecurity startups, and given seminars on cybersecurity. He's here today to talk about how we can use security skills and ideas for anything, including email marketing. Welcome to the show, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here, Barbara. Thank you for having me. Well, you have a lot to impart, I'm sure, because your resume is extremely uh, impressive. Thank you. Uh, how did you get into the business of marketing emails from security? It doesn't seem to me to be uh, a natural shift. Well, I agree with that. Um, so actually, I'm still in uh, security and not marketing. Um, what I think most people don't know is that security underpins a lot of things in business. And what I learned was that I could use security knowledge and skills um, in the traditional ways to defend companies, as what most people think, uh, or to do other things like help uh, with marketing. Uh, so uh, security basically underlies everything that I do. And my only point is we can use it for pretty much anything. Well, that's absolutely true, and we need to use it for absolutely everything. Um, if I receive an email that I don't want, you know, I'll click spam. Uh, what happens when I click the spam button? So when you click the spam button, what that does is it tells that provider that uh, you think it's uh, spam. And so uh, just at a very high level, you know, these email providers, and at this point, pretty much everyone uses either Gmail or Microsoft Office, uh, and there are a few other ones too. Um, but whenever a lot of people click spam, uh, what they do is they try to use machine learning, so like artificial intelligence, uh, to figure out, uh, you know, what's the commonality? You know, is it the same sender? Is it certain words that are in there? You know, what's going on here, right? So if a lot of people are clicking that a particular email is spam, it'll look at that and say, well, in that case, anything that matches this rule, you know, from this particular sender, um, you know, on this particular subject or whatever, that's spam. And then, uh, and then it sort of will put that uh, aside into the spam folder for the other thing. So what you do actually affects what happens in other people's mailboxes. And if, you know, people do that time and again, always from, for example, this sender, um, then at some point they get on a blacklist and no matter what they send, uh, it'll always end up in people's spam boxes. Ouch. Yeah, that hurts. It, it does. It does. And I think a lot of times people, um, they'll send a lot of emails. They don't really know what, what's going on and they end up on blacklist and they don't even know. Right. And a lot of people won't even get their emails because, you know, they're not getting it. So they're not responding. How do you discover that other than saying, you know, to each person, hey, did you get my email? Uh, that's kind of what you have to do, actually. And um, there are a lot of times that, uh, you know, if you send it to a particular um, email provider, I'll just use Gmail and Microsoft because uh, everybody knows those. Uh, maybe it ends up uh, arriving in Gmail, but not arriving in people's Outlook. And it's true that Microsoft uh, spam filters tend to be a little bit more aggressive than Gmail's, just on average, right? I'm sure you can find exceptions, but um, yeah, you basically just need to ask people or you can try testing it yourself. So you can set up your own Gmail and your own Microsoft and your own, a lot of people use like AOL, Yahoo, all these things. You can set those up and then see, you know, if it makes it or not. But uh, at some point uh, it's just people telling you and you get the idea that people are not getting your emails. If you have been blacklisted, is there any way to get off the list or is it just the way that you're uh, structuring your email? It's really, really hard to get off the list once you're on it. Um, so that's why, uh, you know, I think it's always good to have the proactive conversation, right? Um, so to give you an idea, uh, so, you know, once you're on the blacklist, it's not like there's one global blacklist that everybody uses. There's like a dozen, there's two dozen, there's a whole bunch of them. And so, uh, you know, you're basically going to have to apply to each of those, to the administrator of each of those blacklists and say, hey, I'm not a spammer. But guess what? 
like every other spammer is also applying to them to get off the list too. So they, you know, they're not going to verify everybody. Um, so it's once you're on it, you're kind of on it. Um, it's very difficult to, to not be. So that's why you always want to have that conversation up front and be like, hey, what are the things that you're doing? Are you setting things up appropriately so that in the end, you know, you don't end up being on a blacklist and you can't be removed without completely changing your company name uh, or your, your email account or something wow. like that. Because that's what some people actually end up having to do uh, in order to get their emails across because they've just been blacklisted. Email deliverability is a measure of how many of your emails actually reach your subscriber's inbox to what we were just saying. How much does security knowledge improve email deliverability? Uh, quite a bit, actually. So uh, I would say that, you know, uh, just to compare it, right, a lot of marketing folks will do things like figure out when is the best time to send an email, you know, so that people will see it. Or maybe they want to tweak some words in there to try to, you know, get into people's mailboxes. You know, that has some effect. But frankly, if you're not, if you're configuring it properly, you can easily multiply your deliverability by like three times, uh, sometimes even more, um, simply by doing it correctly, technically, you can get those emails into your uh, reader's hands uh, or I guess mobile phones, um, you know, much more effectively than all the other things that people tend to do. Are there different types of emails that listeners should be aware of? Yeah, so there are generally three different types. Um, the first is uh, personal emails. And by personal, I don't mean, I just mean that it's, it's to me, right? So it could be me at my business account, uh, you know, Gary uh, at my business, or it could be Gary at, at, at Gmail, like my, my personal. Um, so there's the personal emails that you send one-to-one. -one and, and those generally aren't a problem. You're not sending thousands of emails per day or anything like that. It, it generally won't get picked up by, by the spam stuff, uh, unless you're sending, I guess, well, yeah, you unless you really are sending it to thousands of people a day. I don't know how many emails you write. Um, but uh, then the That's second- certainly not me. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, but then the uh, second is your transactional email. So um, that's an automated email that's sent as a result of a, of a trigger or an event. So when you buy something from Amazon, it says, hey, thank you, Barbara, for buying this uh, toaster from us, you know, and, and here's your tracking information. Well, only you're getting that. Right. And, and you did something to create that to happen. So that's called a transactional email. And that's and that's handled differently as well. And then you have marketing emails, which are, you know, um, you know, hey, I'm Barbara. And, you know, you, you're sending it out to a mass number of people. They're not necessarily they may have signed up for your mailing list, but they're not asking you specifically to send them that email. They're, you're not they're not triggering anything for you to do that. Mm -hmm. And that would be a marketing email. And that's what we're talking about here today. And I'll just sort of add, you know, the reason it's important to distinguish between these is because what I see oftentimes is people, they mix them up. So like, you know, some people like when they have like a, a local, a local club, right? So like, um, I belong to a, a magic club and uh, they send out a newsletter every month and someone uses their personal email um, to send it out to like a couple hundred people every month. Well, over time, like, you know, half of those people turn over. So like oh, after three or four years, those people no longer want to get it. But rather than respond to them and say, I don't want your newsletter, they click it's spam. And so now that person, um, even though he was just trying to be nice and do right by the club, all of his emails, they always go to spam. Like it, even his personal emails now, because he never separated between, you know, his marketing emails and his personal emails. And that's the way that all these companies are going to be uh, categorizing into those three categories and then they handle them differently. Is there a way that you would send out your emails so that the search engines can distinguish between it being personal versus business? Sure. Um, you know, you can definitely do things differently. I, I would say it's not the search engine that matters. It's really more of the, uh, the email systems, right? So they have spam filters and things like that that are attached to them. Um, but uh, there's a, a number of things that you can do. I, I break them out into uh, a few different categories and each of these categories have a number of things. I don't think we'll have time to talk about all of them, but um, there's things you can do um, uh, before sending your email, like you know, making sure that you uh, have a good list of subscribers, that they are actually real people. Um, some people like buy lists, right? And, and though they're not real um, to some extent, like, they, you know, so um, you have to understand the law, which we can talk about. You have to understand the technical uh, setup, like how are you doing it? That's probably a part that I think um, most doctors, they're 
very competent, but not necessarily, they're more on the body, not as much on the computer stuff. That, that is an area that um, could be improved. Um, there's, uh, you wanted testing. We talked a little bit about, um, you know, opening up your own uh, free accounts in different places and testing it, how you write the message, um, when you're sending it, uh, what you're doing. Um, and, you know, so these are the different categories of, of areas that people can be addressing proactively in order to send out emails that will reach their audiences. Well, that's really important. Uh, can you tell us uh, about some of the um, uh, email marketing that uh, a person can do to optimize it? Uh, sure. So um, we can talk about a kind of each of those areas that I mentioned uh, in a little bit more detail, if that's helpful. And uh, could you explain a little bit about uh, what the uh, Can Spam Act is all about? So yeah, there's a there's a law out there. It's called the uh, Can Spam Act, uh, and it was to sort of help uh, prevent uh, prevent spam. I, I don't know how effective it is, but if you just look up Can Spam C A N dash S P A M, there's a list of like seven things that everybody has to do. Um, and uh, one of those things I think most people don't know um, is that you're supposed to put a, a valid uh, physical postal address in every email that you send if it is a marketing email. And the idea is that spammers generally won't have a physical uh, address. And so if you don't have that in there, that is a flag uh, for some of these uh, other companies to say, hey, you know, they're not even following the can spam app, so it is probably going to be spam. Uh, so if they think it's a marketing email that doesn't follow the can spam app, they will often put it into the spam box. How do you know if your uh, market has a sufficient bandwidth for the information that you'd like to send out? Um, I didn't quite answer, uh, understand the question. Could you paraphrase that? Uh, well, sometimes if a person wants to send out uh, content, uh, their consumers don't have the bandwidth to receive it so that instead of having images and videos that you really are uh, restricted to using just um, a small amount of, um, you know, verbiage itself. How, how do you know if that's going to be an issue? Sure. Uh, so uh, something like that, um, that's, uh, I, I would just say you have to use a rule of thumb, right? So generally speaking, uh, you're not going to know exactly what the bandwidth is for any of your receivers. Um, you, won't, you won't know that unless somebody shows you or tells you about it. Um, so what you're going to have to do uh, is just make certain assumptions, right? So if you think that you know, most of the people who are receiving it are going to be looking at it on their phones uh, you know, or over the internet on Wi-Fi, um, you can make certain assumptions. I would say that if you could send an email that's you know, no more than a couple hundred uh, kilobytes, that's probably perfectly fine. Like you should be able to load that on any phone. Just recognize that some folks, um, you know, they will set it so that they don't auto load images. Uh, so you may not, you know, whatever you see on your screen might not show up on their screen because they are not loading images. And you also want to make sure that you're formatting it in a way that looks good on both the computer and also uh, on the phone. Uh, so those are some things you might want to think about. But if you can keep it to less than, you know, a couple hundred kilobytes, I think you would be perfectly fine. Just don't make it megabytes and megabytes because, yeah, that would be a problem. Okay, so what we could take from this is that, you know, things are changing all the time. And when you're talking about business, it's really crucial to get a security expert in on the ground floor before you wind up... Uh, with a problem and if, because of your blacklisted, you know, like that's like professional death. <laughs> yeah, it makes it much more challenging for the, for the, for them to get the um, information that you're trying to send out. Yes. Yes. And in terms of business, um, you're probably much better off outsourcing it to an expert instead of, you know, trying to do these things yourself. I would say so. Um, I do think that a lot of people like to just do it on their own um, because it saves money. And my, my point is that you're, you're it, yeah, it does save you a lot of money, but you're also probably not getting a return <laughs> because um, you're not, you know, people aren't getting your emails. Uh, so I would suggest that if it is something that um, you want to do on your own, that you just read up on uh, marketing emails uh, and 
understand all of the different aspects of what you can do, uh, like not just what you write in the content, but also the technical stuff. And if you read it and your eyes glaze over, then you probably are better off uh, outsourcing it uh, and finding some help. Um, but if you do read it and understand all of it and can do it, then you just need to set aside the time to actually do it. Uh, and if you don't do any of those things, then don't be surprised if people aren't getting your newsletters. Uh, Gary, how can our listeners reach you? I'm sure that they're intrigued by your services and are just chomping at the bit to have you work with them. <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate that. Um, you can reach me at my website, alfizo, A-L-F-I-Z-O.com. And if you just uh, scroll to the bottom, there's a contact form and, uh, you know, they can reach out there and I'll always respond. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. It was really very enlightening. This has been another episode of Marketing Tips for Doctors with your host, Dr. Barbara Hales, speaking with Gary Chan. Thank you. Thank you. Till next time. <laughs>